Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 190, we're going to talk about a new preamp that we designed. And are we ever getting close to 200? I think we're going to have to do something special for that episode. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Maybe we'll take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And a big heads up, our huge summer sale starts, well, it already started today. <laughs> uh, I, I think for some people it started last night. <laughs> yep. And this is how we say a big thank you to our many, many excellent customers and YouTube viewers. And it gives you the opportunity to stock up on spares at a more affordable price. And at the end of the show, we'll take a look at some really nice new arrivals just in time for the sale. And we managed to find enough new old stock RFT EL34s, one of our favorites. And they're actually on sale during the sale. So what is that when you have two sales? Yeah, double sale, it's sale double squared, sale. something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, so they'll be at their very best price this year. So last week we talked about how important preamps are to every aspect of the audio chain. And today we're going to take a first look at a brand new Melaton Amps preamp design. This guy right here. Now, a fair question would be, if you already have two great sounding control preamps, why a third with, you know, three question marks afterwards? <laughs> At least that's how the script is written. Um, well, for a long time, we've been working a couple of problems. Our traditional line that are on this cherry uh, plinth with uh, a thick nice... aluminum top plate. Yeah. yeah. Our traditional line, um, they're just too expensive for many of our customers. And, you know, they're handcrafted, so there's a lot of labor in them. The material costs are expensive as well. And they're not the easiest kits to build for first time kit builders, for beginners. Mm -hmm. So Charles and I have been working uh, up to come up with a solution. And what we've ended up with is a completely new line of kits that we're going to call the modern line or ML for short. And they're going to be much more affordable, easier to build. In fact, so easy, you could probably put one of them together in a, in a weekend of easy work. But here's the thing, something really amazing happened while we were designing the new preamp. And we ended up creating a, a really unique sounding pre, completely different than anything we've ever designed before. And you might say, what? so different. Well, it punches. It punches very, very fast. Or to use a more technical term, it has a very um, fast or high slew rate. Now, that's a term that's typically used to describe power amp performance. But I don't see why you can't use uh, it to describe how a preamp performs. Basically, what it means is that the preamp responds rapidly to changes in the signal voltage. And I think you can really hear it. I mean, Charles and I, we were, we were just completely surprised we at the sonics. At the responsiveness and at the, the individual detail in different uh, instruments that you could hear and how they weren't distorting each other. It was amazing. Now, among audiophiles, there's a great divide. There are audiophiles that love a sound that punches fast and hard, uh, in which um, if somebody plucks uh, the string of a guitar or, um, or, or drops a vocal in suddenly into the music, it really stands out as a sort of a unique artifact sonically. And then there are those audiophiles that want everything sort of flat and level and with, with no accents on the music that are really... Standing out. Standing out. Hmm. And so if you went to, for example, Japan, I suspect that people would absolutely love that punchy sound. But if you're used to listening to um, um, source music that's digital, 
No matter how good your streaming service is or your digital files, you're probably used to a much more neutral sound and you might hate the sound of this preamp. Or on the other hand, <laughs> you might love it. <laughs> you might love it because you might be just totally underwhelmed by the flatness of the digital sound. Um, now we listen mostly to analog, though we have some high quality DACs here, um, but we listen mostly to vinyl and reel-to-reel -reel tape. And, um, and they naturally have a bit of a punch to them. And really good dynamics. Yeah, surprisingly good dynamics. In fact, we were playing something, a record the other day, and Charles had to keep turning it down because <laughs> even though technically I think you can only get about 58 dB on a record, I think they had recorded all 58 dB. And when you have that much dynamic range, mm. uh, it's just insane. And if you make use of all of it with some very quiet passages and some very loud passages, just wow. <laughs> okay, so the tubes often have a lot to play with sonics. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I would say it's 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 conditional normal, right? The we could take as much credit as we can for the design concept. And there's going to be some videos in which we talk about that. We'll do something really long uh for the Melatone Kit channel uh for the more technically interested people and we'll talk about the schematic and more detail on the circuit. This yeah. is just sort of an introduction and overview. And by the way, the, the new uh, chassis won't look anything like this. We just used our standard uh, traditional uh, chassis because we have a lot of parts. They're easy actually to manufacture one-offs this way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you'll be really quite happy with how the new, the new chassis is going to be modern. It's going to be completely different than this. Um, and a lot easier to assemble. Yeah. Now, the voltage gain tube is, in preamps, is the critical tube. I mean, all the tubes in the preamp matter, but what if, what if you chose them sort of as the main tube? Well, actually, there's more than one option, but the main one we started with, the one that we focused on, is the 6N1P EV. So this is a, a medium gain dual tryout. It's somewhere in the range of something like a 6DJ8, and they were produced in the Soviet Union. And uh, I believe the ones that we have are mostly Voskhod rockets. And they are they are a really interesting and great sounding dual tryout that we've been wanting to use uh, ever since we first listened to them, uh, probably a, a couple of years ago now. They have a very open, unique sonic presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I built a prototype preamp years ago, and as soon as I heard it, I said, someday, someday we're going to use this in a preamp. And that day is, it's here. Yeah, so that's the primary tube here, but this amp was also designed with the idea of uh, being a tube roller's wet dream. Um, <laughs> This tube is the voltage gain. This is the cathode follower, which is one of our other favorites, the 6N6P dual tryout. It's a fantastic cathode follower, but in this voltage gain stage, we can run probably six or seven different tubes, and they're all biased in a really nice area. Let's see if we can remember some. 6CG7. 6CG7, 6GU7, uh, 6BZ7, 6BQ7, 6N6P, 6N1P, uh, 6DJ8, 6922, 6 6 6 6 6 6 6702, 7308. 6 I'm cheating a little bit because those last two are all 6DJ8s. 6 6 and, and the 6N23P. So all of these will run in this tube. Uh, in this tube. In this amp. <laughs> We're talking about tubes. Um, and uh, we've swept them all. We've listened to them all. They all sound great. Now, when um, you say swept, what do you mean? Uh, we do frequency sweeps. We we check to make sure that we're getting a flat output from um, from a full sweep from all the way down, I think, to 5 hertz up to over 20 kilohertz. And we check the distortion numbers to make sure there's nothing in there that is, uh, that is problematic. And sometimes it tells us a little bit, too, about how well a tube is performing and where some of that magic is coming from. Sometimes it forces us to go back and do some new design work. In this case, we were so impressed with how it sounded that we actually didn't sweep it until well into the design stage. And then we were just... Which could have been a big mistake. <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't. We trust our ears. I would say when it comes to development work, we put, um, we put about a third of our time is actually critically listening to the product. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's really important. And I think that's what's been missing for a, a lot of new designs that have come out. Nobody's actually listened to the things or, you know, not, 
not in any serious way. And um, so long as it meets the specifications that they think consumers will buy, then out it goes to the marketplace. And uh, that's just not the way to design a gear. I yeah, mean, and for us, the sound is the most important part. So, yeah. and. So one of the other concepts of this, not only can it roll a whole bunch of different tubes, but all you have to do is roll one of them. You only need one dual triode with match sections. And that's so that people can roll tubes without breaking the bank these days. And a lot of the ones that are optional for here are actually very reasonably priced. You can run some very high end 7308 6DJ8 types in here that are very expensive, but, but you can you, also run a 6BZ7 or a 6N1P. Which is a very affordable tube. And yeah. Um, yeah, so there'll be a lot more to come with this and with the modern line. We're really quite excited. Mm -hmm. We're trying, I mean, when we first started the kit business, our goal was to bring audio file grade um, gear at an affordable price to our customers. And I think we've almost attained that goal, but I think, uh, I think because we've never pandered to the ultra wealthy and um, we don't have any uh, dreams of each having a gold Rolex and, <laughs> and a Lamborghini in the driveway, though I think it would be fun to have a Lamborghini. Um, actually, I wouldn't want a Lamborghini. No. I wouldn't want anything like that. Oh, well, a Volkswagen camper would be cool, especially if they built battery powered ones, um, <laughs> which apparently is in the works. But anyways, I digress. So there'd be a lot more to come and talk about. So let's head over it back into the lab. And um, well, actually, first, we're going to have a listen to it. And oh, yeah, I forgot. I believe you have what we're going to listen to right here. Yeah. Let's take a look. Yeah, yeah, this is or I'm going to talk about this in just a minute uh, in brief, but this is uh, one of my favorite um, classical recordings of all time. This is the reissue box, and um, and it's you'll you'll hear it in a minute. So I I don't need any more of an introduction, um, and uh, hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, let's roll. Okay, wow. What did you all think of that? Well, it's one of my favorite classical recordings, period. In fact, in the um, among classical uh, 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 listeners, it's considered to be one of the greatest 
solo cello uh, performances ever. And among audiophiles, it's considered to be one of the greatest um, classical recordings ever made as well. So that's, <laughs> that's saying a lot. And I think you can hear why in that little uh, sound bite. And hopefully you could hear um, the extraordinary sonics of the um, of the preamp. It's just blown us away. It's uh, I, I think it's staying in the system for quite some time here while we we get used to the sound. <laughs> yeah, and we have to put some hours on it. But you'll you'll, you'll we'll be back to talk more about um, about the uh, the production prototype when we've got it assembled, and um, and we'll we'll be doing some more. Um, uh, tube labs and uh, yeah, some more recordings, some more tube rolling. Uh, it should be fun. Yeah. Okay, Charles, what have you got that came that came in this week? Well, quite a bit. Um, so we've kind of pared it down a little bit here because this video's already probably run long enough. Uh, we're going to start over on the right hand side here with a couple of very high gain preamp tubes, and this is one of our favorite six SL sevens. This is the uh, Sylvania late version. This one's labeled, I believe, for Philips here. Yeah, Philips bought Sylvania in about 1980-81. And they've got these very unique looking sort of oval winged plates on them. And many of these were military stocked. You can tell by the jans that are on them. And they're also very high gain tubes. Ooh, let me get that in focus. You can see here our normal New old stock gain for these is around 80. And this is testing around 110 on centered. And we're actually running a pair of these in our universal uh, kit phono preamp. And I, I think you suggested we try them. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I think the, re the regular Sylvanias sound so amazing. Uh, I'm not really interested in trying something else. And well, these, to be fair, they do. But yeah. They do. And these actually have just stayed in the system. And mm -hmm. that's... That's an indicator of just how good they sound. Uh, they're low noise, low microphonic, high gain. Uh, they're a great option if you find that your preamp just doesn't have enough gain and you need a little bit more. Yeah. So we've got some more of those in new old stock, ready to go. And we managed to find a few more of these absolutely beautiful Matsushita 12AX7s. And we found some used. Um, we, we still had some used stock of them. But our new old stock, I think, sold out probably the second day after we announced we had them. <laughs> uh, everybody wants new old stock 12AX7s. And these, in our opinion, are probably one of the best that were ever made. They are just fantastic sounding for a 12AX7. And these are not heavily used, right? In fact, we don't sell heavily used tubes. They're testing fairly close to new old oh, stock. Oh, no, these are actually new old stock. We have one new old stock pair of them. That's it. Ah. <laughs> and we have a bunch of used that are also testing near new old stock. So we've got those guys, and we've found some beautiful 6CG7s, two different kinds. We actually have some Matsushita-made versions in. And we haven't talked about these very much, but they're also a, a very good sounding tube. The 6CG7, of course, is the 9-pin equivalent of a 6SN7 and can work in its place with the correct 9-pin to octal adapter that we also carry. And these are a very unique sounding tube. Matsushita made some very nice tubes. Yeah, and a lot of our customers who are running 6SN7s have been buying up 6CG7s and 6GU7s using the high quality adapter that we stock and we've been getting nothing but uh, compliments as to how good they sound. Yep. It's, it is a different sound than the 6SN7 which tends to be um, sort of on the warmer edge of things, warmer side. Let's keep those labels up so people can find the numbers. <laughs> We got so many numbers in our inventory that, uh, um, it, in fact, if you send us a note uh, asking about a particular tube, if you know the inventory number, use that, please, because it helps us zero in on what you're talking about. Yep. What's the last tube you've got? Uh, last one is another crowd favorite. It's another 6CG7, the Toshiba. And this, I believe, is, yeah, this is a used version. We actually haven't been able to find many new old stock versions, although we do still have some in the store. But what we did find were a decent number of used and clearly very good testing tubes. Yeah, 100% uh, on the GM scale is essentially new old stock, though mm -hmm. it has a plus and minus. So normally the minus goes down about... 20% to 80 and the plus goes up 10%. So 80 to 110 
uh, is essentially testing the old stock. Some tubes are better at being centered at 100 and some tubes aren't like the the early Tungsol G6SN7 GTBs, 100% or a new old stock tube typically tests in the low 80s. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty just, commonly. It's just the way they are. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a shock sometimes when we see them actually testing up to uh, manufacturer's specifications. <laughs> yeah, it's rare. Those, those are the outliers. Those are the high testers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's a bunch of preamp tubes, and we've gotten in some more power tubes. So let's clear the deck, and we'll be right back. Well, we've managed, um, surprisingly, to find an awful lot of new old stock RFT EL34s. RFT um, made um, uh, a lot of tubes in the former East Germany, also uh, known as the DDR. And um, the quality of those uh, East German plants was so good that companies like Siemens um, and Telefunken were rebranding them and selling them as their own. And of course, labor costs were, were lower and they were, I think they were probably desperate for Western currency. So uh, they were happy to sell in the West. But, but they made a very good quality tube. I mean, it's of all the EL34s that we really get behind, we have three vintage tubes. Number one is is the Mullard XF2. And they're starting to get pretty rare. Uh, we still have some good inventory, but we're not replacing it at any rate equivalent to how the tubes are going out. I think we just sell, sold a quad just this morning. Yeah, we're and probably finding one tube for every four we're selling, so they're so, not gonna last too long. No, they're endangered. Uh, the other tube is um, the True Vintage Svetlana. Um, EL34 made in St. Petersburg. They're lovely tubes. They're a little bit on the warmer side like the Mullards. And the RFTs are incredibly detailed for an, an EL34. Um, and they are a rock solid tube, which is really important with power tubes. It's not good enough just to have a great sounding tube, but the bloody things have to last. They're long lived, they're consistent testing, um, they're just very reliable, and there were very few versions of them made, which makes it really easy to match them up. Yeah, and so here's the Telefunken branded one. Let's just see how this quad measures up now. 60 milliamps is the center on our tester for new old stock. Yep. And this one doesn't have a label, but it's sitting at 61 milliamps. And this one actually has, let me get it up on camera a little closer so you can see it. This actually has one of the original RFT labels. Which is actually pretty rare. You, you more often see them rebranded or unbranded than you do with an RFT label on them. So this is sitting at 59 milliamps and this is not branded either. And it's sitting at 61 milliamps. With power tubes, even uh, no matter how the bias is set with your power tubes, um, unless you're running a high distortion guitar amp, you really, for, for home audio, you really, or in the studio, you really want to be, um, I would say within 5% for a really hard to find a very early power tube, um, uh, like the Svetlana KT88s uh, that are now essentially extinct, extinct unfortunately. Uh, I would say 10% would be acceptable. So 59 to 61 is essentially a perfect match. Um, it doesn't get much better than that. But what's not perfectly matched are the labels. And I don't know, for some reason in the last three months maybe, we've had a lot of customers who've taken issue with mismatched labels. And I think it's because we've got a lot of new customers who are brand new to tubes. Mm -hmm. And they just don't understand that Almost, I would say, half of all tubes ever made were... Were rebranded, yeah. They I mean, were rebranded. Anybody that's been on the channel for a long enough time has heard us probably mention this over and over and over again, but you have to match by the tube type, the build, and the testing numbers first. The labels always come second after that. At last after that. Yeah. Yeah, and we do our best with the boxes. Uh, with new old stock tubes like these... Charles keeps, he has a huge box inventory, folks. Yep. And uh, I don't even dare go look for the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. And But anyways, he'll do his best with the boxes to actually match them up. But anyways, sonically, think about the electrical parameters first. Trust us on this. That's the most important thing. Visuals, I know in our society, visuals have become sort of the thing. If it looks really um, perfect and sexy, yeah. then 
in our brains, we've been taught by advertising that that's the good product. Mm -hmm. In vacuum tubes, they're an electrical product. Yeah, but you see a lot of modern production being dressed up with shiny bases, fancy oh, glass shapes. Fancy fitted boxes yeah, for yeah. our Chinese too. Added fitted boxes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think we could double our price if we put fitted boxes. Yeah, we should look into that. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, so if you stayed to the very end, here's the summer sale code. Uh, it's just summer 2024. The sale um, has already started today and it's going to run for a week until Sunday. And I always forget to pull up the date. Charles will get us the, the last day of the sale. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be Sunday. The 16th. No, that's this. You goofed that oh, up. Yeah, I goofed that up. Sorry. Yeah. Sunday the 23rd. <laughs> yeah. Sunday the 23rd is the final sale day. So you got a little bit over a week. Um, but the... Customers who have participated in the summer sale know that if you want to guarantee that you get the tubes that you want, you jump in early because some of the very high demand stuff that we, you know, we put in the store for the summer sale, um, they, they go almost right away. In fact, uh, we've almost been overwhelmed this morning with orders coming in. So anyways, and of course, uh, if your order is $150 or more, you can't see it's covered up here. After uh, discount, yeah. then the shipping is on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.